All right, we are live on YouTube. I'm gonna go ahead and broadcast us to Zoom. And we are now live. Hello, students that are joining us right now. Before we get started, I just wanted to point out uh, the chat feature. We're going to be interacting with you today via chat. So just find your way down to the chat button. But more importantly, when you click on that, please adjust to all panelists and attendees. Uh, let us know where you're from here in the chat. Before we get started, we're a little early. We'll be starting right on time at 7. Uh, just take a look there at the... Uh, at the chat, let's let us see where you're from. We have Arizona in the house, Norway, hey. Awesome. Iowa, California, Utah here. All right, Scott, lots of people for you here today, bud. Oh, I got, yeah. Jersey, hey. Sergio in California, Fairfield, Brandon, in Seattle. Uh, let's see, Akash in India. Hey, thanks for being here right now. Mickey in Chicago. We have Iran in the house tonight. Awesome. Chituri. Daria in Maryland. Emmanuel in Baltimore. Thanks for being here. Long Beach. Hey, Carly. All right. So, hey, for those of you just joining us, we'll be getting started here at 7. I uh, just wanted to make sure that you find your way to the chat button and adjust to all panelists and attendees uh, first tonight, uh, but not the star of the show. I'm going to be in taking your questions in the chat, interacting with you that way, making sure that I send all of your questions over here to Scott, the star of our show tonight. Uh, we have someone, Saul, here from Earth, the Milky Way. That's awesome. <laughs> Franklin, Tennessee. So, Scott, there's two Scots here from Franklin, Tennessee. Oh, that's, that's me. <laughs> Same name. No, I know it was you. I saw <laughs> There's not a lot of Scott Christians out there. Yeah. All right. El Paso is in the house. Your evil twin. The message is coming from your house. <laughs> Signal is close. Jessica, Colorado. Yeah, two people from Earth. Nice. A lot in common today. All right. Boston. What's up, Justin? All right. Hey, so in the chat, well, we're just buying some time to get started. Uh, let me know what programs you're looking into, what grades you're in. If you're in high school, are you out of school? Are you looking at illustration, animation? What are you looking to do here? Hello from Brazil. All right. Illustration, great. All right. High school in the house. I like it. Some nice. right now. You remember those days, Scott? I do. I do. <laughs> we have some juniors here, a lot of seniors, Brooklyn, New York, sophomore. Sophomore. Nice. Really a senior in college. All right. Thank you, Juliet, for being here. Uh, we can talk about our grad programs for you as well. We have uh, Brandon in the military. All right, man. Thank you for your service, buddy. Perfect. So we still have a little bit of time here before we're supposed to get started. We have participants jumping in. Um, one thing I'm gonna do before we get started, usually I don't do this this early, but um, one thing if you're out there and you're just uh, paying attention real quick, I'm gonna send you my email. I just put it in the chat here. Uh, so my name is Hector Verdugo. I'm the Senior Vice President of Admissions here. So I run all admissions for the university, whether you're an international student or domestic, whether you're a graduate student or undergraduate student, but I'm putting in my information there because um, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions people are gonna have, people are gonna to wanna to talk later, or they're just gonna to wanna to get the process started and figure out how to get going. So whether you're military, high school student, uh, whether you're grad, undergrad, domestic, international, please make sure you take down my e email. Uh, if you can't even send me an email now, if you have the time so we can try at least to open up a conversation later and I can try to figure out how to help you. Um, we don't have any post-grad, I mean, we have, MA and MFA degrees, uh, that's where we stopped though, Mickey. All right. 
So just a couple more minutes here, Scott, and we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like there's about 115 students on right now. Anybody that just joined us, make sure that you're adjusting your chat to all panelists and attendees, please. This way we can catch all your questions, we can interact. I'm gonna do my best to be monitoring the chat the entire workshop, uh, but also working here with Scott, so. Uh, yeah. So sneak peek, if any of you out there have Netflix, I'd say check out a cool movie we're gonna talk about today called Animal Crackers. Mr. Scott here's gonna talk a lot about that today. Quick little plug if you haven't seen it, check it out. Yeah, please do. Let me know what you think. And ask Hector a lot of questions. Oh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Alaska Williams. Yes, and so hey, everybody out there, if you can hear me, um, whatever email that you registered for this event, you will receive a copy of this recording sent to you automatically. So nothing more to do, no reason to request anything. Don't worry about it. It's going to be sent to the email that you use to sign up with this. So, and I've seen some emails come through. Thank you so much for reaching out. I appreciate it. I'm more than happy to spend the time to connect with anybody that needs some help here. So about two minutes, we're going to go ahead and get started here. So, uh, just hang in there for a quick second, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started right on time. Amanda, the email is uh, usually what happens is if students want to talk, set up a meeting, go over programs, have specific questions, I'll be the person to work with you and make sure I can uh, help you get set up for everything. So if you're going to need any help whatsoever for the university, anything, just send me an email and we'll set up a time to talk. I'll be more than happy to get back to you. So yes, Craig, a master's degree is possible. We do have uh, two different master's options. We have an MA option and we have an MFA option. One is 36 units, the other one is 63 units. Um, what happens is recommendations will come once we talk to you, we just get a better understanding of your background, if you have any related um, or any related experience. So some of these programs are gonna be better for others. Some people that have some experience may want to look at the MA option. Some students may want to take the full MFA. The beauty is, is that even if you have no related experience whatsoever, we have a graduate program to help you to get started. So either way. All right. And what do I use to apply to this college full remote? I'm a senior in high school. Uh, Jocelyn, to answer your question, uh, just send me an email. I'll be happy to go over everything for you. Just send me a quick email and we'll connect about it later. And uh, hey, out there to you. Thank you so much. All right. So, hey, Scott, if you're ready to get started, let's do it. Yeah. All, All right. right. So, hey, everybody. Um, let me get you introduced if that's okay. Um, so, welcome, folks, yeah. to our event tonight. Uh, we're super excited to have you. Uh, so, we have the star of the show here, Scott Christian Sava. He's going to be helping us out tonight uh, by covering a lot of content. Before we get started, my name is Hector Verdugo. I'm the Senior Vice President of Admissions. So I'm going to be your host tonight. So I'm going to direct everybody to the chat button there. Make sure if you haven't already, click on the chat and adjust to all panelists and attendees. The more questions, the better. We're going to have a lot of talking here by Scott, and I'm going to be more than happy to fish out your questions and make sure that we're interacting with Scott and going back and forth. Before we get started, I do want to take this time. Anybody out there that is a gamer, anybody out there is interested in video games, uh, next week, same time like we always do on Tuesday nights, we have events next week is going to be focused on the art and science of video game creation. This is going to be hosted by David Goodwine. He is the executive director of our game, uh, our game development program. So uh, check that out. There's a link right there so you can check out that event next week. And also here's a link for everybody out there. If you want to just look at a bunch of the events that are coming up, always doing really cool events this whole month and the rest of the is already stacked. So please check that out if you can. Lots of good stuff going on. So uh, before we get started, let me go and introduce the star of the show here, Mr. Scott Christian Sava. He's actually an alumni here from Academy of Art uh, from 1991. So he's an animator, illustrator, director, writer, producer, and part-time hobby. Over the last 20 years, Scott's brought <laughs> some of the world's most beloved characters to life in film, television, comics, and games. From Casper the Friendly Ghost, to the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, to Star Trek, and Spider-Man. Scott's unique talents and vision 
have called have been called upon Disney, Universal Studios, Nickelodeon, and more. In 2000, he founded Blue Dream Studios, which has produced work for Star Wars, X Files, Aliens, and Predator. I'm sorry, Aliens versus Predator, Spider Man, and other franchises. In addition to creating his own line of kids graphic novels. The studio's first feature film, Animal Crackers, is now on Netflix and was the summer of 2020's number one animated movie in the world. So Scott and his wife have two kids. They live in Franklin, Tennessee. Scott's mission, to simply put it, is to make the world a kinder, gentler place. Before we out of time. So folks, once again, my name is Hector Dugo. I'm gonna be your host tonight. You're gonna to see me in the chat and I'll be back on later. I'm going to hand this over to Scott to get started, and I'll see you all. Thanks, Hector. Appreciate it. And everybody, please ask a ton of questions because I asked Hector to interrupt me. So don't let me ramble too long, okay? Ask a lot of questions. All right. I'm going to share my screen and take you to the Wayback Machine. All right. Um, so uh, all I ever wanted to do was be the artist in Spider-Man. These are some of my drawings from when I was a kid. Uh, it was all I'd ever wanted to do. Uh, when I graduated high school, uh, I got accepted into the Academy of Art. Um, I could not find a picture of figure drawing class in Bradley Hall circa 1987, but I think this artist representation kind of sums it up pretty well. Uh, we took a lot of figure drawing classes. Um, in 1987, there were no computers. There was no animation classes. Uh, your choices were fine art, graphic design, illustration, or photography, pretty much. And uh, I wanted to do comic books, so the closest thing was illustration. Um, there was a lot of anatomy classes that I took. And uh, these are some of my notes. We had to take a history of illustration. I learned all about, you know, everybody from Maxfield Parish to Howard Pyle to Charles Dana Gibson. Um, these are some JC Leindecker sketches I did in my sketchbook. Um, this was my art back in 1987, 88, uh, going through the school. I could not figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I was doing colored pencils, Prismacolors. I was doing watercolors and markers and uh, airbrush and anything I could could find. And I just never really found a style. It just didn't click. Um, then something weird happened. Uh, I got uh, an internship at Sega of America. Um, so this was 1990, my junior year. And Sega, they were making the Sega Genesis. And they were just finishing up the Dick Tracy game based on the uh, Warren Beatty movie. And um, I did a little painting illustration uh, to, to kind of get my way into the uh, into the uh, program and I did and I learned and you could see the um, uh, this is one of the samurais uh, that I did uh, for this 16-bit video game so everything was pixel by pixel uh, we had to draw everything pixel by pixel the game was called Kid Chameleon and that really introduced me to and I and I'd always been a fan of video games but this introduced me to that as being a career again still wanted to make comic books still in school but it gave me uh, some experience. So when I graduated, I had a job at Atari Games. And, uh, and instead of being an artist, I actually was hired to be a game designer, which was really cool. And one of the games I designed was a game called, uh, at the time it was called T-Rex. And it was a stop motion game. And here's some of my drawings uh, for the moves, but it became a game called Primal Rage uh, after I left. And uh, so it was a Street Fighter kind of ripoff using stop motion animation uh, and dinosaurs and monkeys and, and whatnot, which was really kind of cool. Um, while I was working at Atari, I'd go to comic conventions every single year, trying to get that job making Spider-Man. That's all I wanted to do. Um, at the time I was into Star Trek and I had done this illustration um, of Worf uh, from Star Trek The Next Generation. And someone from a company called Malibu Comics saw it and they gave me a call and they hired me to do a series of Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Next Generation comics, which was really cool. Cause now I was actually, while I was working during the day uh, in video games, I was at night doing these Star Trek covers. So I was kind of working in comics now and it got 
to where they were asking me to do enough stuff. I was doing work on Mortal Kombat and some of their other stuff that I actually left Atari and I went down to Los Angeles. Um, we worked there for a little bit and then the company got bought by Marvel Comics and I took a job. Oh, sorry. Next thing was I was doing uh, some X-Men trading cards. I got to do, so again, getting closer to Spider-Man every time, getting closer. Um, I got to uh, work with Marvel Comics now, working on Star Trek Voyager. Um, I'm this guy here. That's my cousin I brought with me. But I got to meet the cast. I got to walk on the set, which was really cool. Um, that's the cover I did for Star Trek Voyager. And, uh, and then I tried out for a job in movies. And uh, they were making a sequel to the Casper movies. And at the time, and this was the probably the late 90s, uh, maybe 1997, um, there was no, still no animation classes, especially for CGI. There was no animation classes. So when I went to try out, uh, it was a software I'd never heard of before. It was doing movie animations, what I, which I'd never done but everybody was an engineer. Everybody was a video editor. No one had any art experience. And so from that pool of people, I just kind of rose up through the ranks and I became lead animator on Casper, on, on uh, Stretch, the, the uncle. And so I got a ton of work from it. And it was a really great experience once I figured out how to, how to work the software. Um, so after that, I got a job at Saban doing Power Rangers. Um, I got to animate the Red Ranger. And then I was getting so much work. I did a TV show called Cyber Nine. I did Alien vs. Predator, NASCAR Rach Racers, Digimon, uh, The X-Files, that I had to start farming out work because I just couldn't handle it all. But I was, everybody liked my work and there was just, there were no animators at this time. So I met a guy online uh, in Spain. His name was Jaime Maestro. And we kind of formed Blue Dream Studios. And I would take on as much work as I could and I would send it, uh, send the other stuff to him and he would do it and he would have a team of people. And it was a really, really good thing. Uh, in 2000 and about 2000, uh, I was at a comic convention and I met uh, Len Wein and Marv Wolfman. Um, they had written a book that I still had from the seventies. It was a novel called uh, Mayhem in Manhattan. It was a Spider-Man novel. And I had this idea of, what if I can get them to let me illustrate that as a graphic novel and maybe we could sell that to Marvel? Because I'd tried everything for probably 15 years at that point and no, Marvel just wanted nothing to do with me. So they agreed and I illustrated <clears throat> four pages, four or five pages of Spider-Man in my colored pencils and marker style and it got turned down. And uh, again, it's it just wasn't, in the style that they were looking for. And it wasn't really that great. Well, Marv suggested that I take my day job of doing animation and apply it to movies or into the comic books. And so just for fun, we made up just some, and please re remember this is, this is 1999 or 2000. And, uh, but this is what CGI was, was gonna look like uh, on your home computer. But we did this and we sent it into Marvel and they loved it. And uh, in 2001, I got the job. I got my lifetime job. And so uh, for the next 10 months, I did four issues of Spider-Man and it was called uh, uh, Spider-Man Quality of Life. And I just had a blast and I applied as much of animation as I could to it. You can see the bottom three frames uh, of this one on the right, you know, they're just panels of animation. Um, this next, uh, these are the other covers. This next, this is just um, a breakdown. There was a, a single page of five panels, but just to show you what I was doing was actually animating the, the, the frames. And so that's really how I saw the comics was to kind of take frames of animation and do that. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And, um, it's weird to have something that you, you know, I was, I think 32 at the time is to have a dream since you were like five or six and actually get to do it. And I did. And, and I had studied illustration and then I got into video games and then I got into comic book covers. Then I got into trading cards and I got into movies and I got into TV 
and then all the way back to comic books again to do Spider-Man. But I had applied all of the stuff I'd learned in animation uh, into that, and it became this this kind of mission accomplished. So uh, there I am at 32. My wife and I had been married for nine years at that point, and I just went, I don't know what to do next. So we did what every couple would do, and we had kids, um, and we had twins. <laughs> so uh, it was at that point I, I we had the kids, and we're trying to figure out what to do. And Marv Wolfman and Len Wein, uh, who, by the way, Marv Wolfman created Blade and the Teen Titans, and Len Wein created Wolverine. And uh, they sat me down. They said, Scott, stop going to Marvel and DC and trying to get more work. And I said, why? And they said, because we, we, did, we worked for them for 30, 40 years, and they're off making money, millions and millions and millions of dollars off of our creation. And we don't see a dime of it. He said, create your own properties, create your own, tell your own stories and own it. And I took that advice and I started making books. And um, I wrote eight books in the series of the Dreamland Chronicles for my kids. I wrote books about aliens, Ed's terrestrials, uh, Cameron is dinosaurs. So I got dinosaurs, I got pirates, I got uh, hyperactive as a kid with super speed. My grandparents are secret agents, the luckiest boy. I got robots from the pet robots, I got magic carpet. And I just kept writing books and books and books and books and books for my kids. Anything that seemed interesting to them um, was interesting to me and it was a ton of fun. Well. We, uh, the boys were about four, we moved to Franklin, Tennessee. And I started to get calls from Hollywood and uh, they started to option my, my books uh, for movies, which was really exciting. Um, it, it doesn't pay a lot of money, but it was really cool because if they ever turned it into a movie, then I might make some money and, and it'd be kind of cool to see a movie happen. Um, we waited around for about four years and nothing happened. It just just sat there. Um, so um, a friend of mine, his name's Kevin Grievous, he played Rays in uh, Underworld, but he also wrote Underworld. Um, he told me, he said, you need to write uh, a screenplay. You need to just, you know, don't, don't wait for them, just write a screenplay. I said, I went to art school. I was an illustration major. I don't know anything about writing screenplays. And his response was, I was a microbiologist when I wrote Underworld. You don't need a degree in screenwriting to write a screenplay. You just do it. And he convinced me to do it. And so I did. Um, we started to get some, some traction from studios that maybe we might actually get to make our own movie. And then my publisher, who had published all of those books, went under. And uh, they didn't pay us all of the money that we owed. And suddenly now we were, our house was in foreclosure. We were on food stamps. My wife went back to work. Um, there was a local pizza place called Joey's Pizza here in Nashville. And they found out that we were struggling and, uh, and they just started saying, don't know, you don't need to pay for food. You don't need to pay for food. They just fed us for the next year. They fed us. They would, this is, uh, that's Chris, Joey's wife. Um, she would buy the boys Christmas gifts, you know, birthday gifts. They, they just, they took care of us. They were our surrogate family. They took care of us and we never forgot about that. And then in 2014, a miracle happened. We got money. Uh, we found some investors in China who handed us like $12 million. And uh, next thing we know, we went from food stamps in our house in foreclosure to making a movie. And uh, now I'd never written a script. I had never directed a movie. I had never done anything. So I got a um, uh, couple people I knew, Dean Laurie, who wrote Arrested Development, came on to uh, help me with the script. Um, Tony Bancroft, who directed the movie Mulan, came on and helped me to direct the film. And we went out to go cast for the film. Uh, the next thing we actually did was we got to go to Spain because remember Jaime Maestro, Jaime Maestro who helped me out back in 1997. Um, he was the one who I hired and I said, let's, let's make a movie together. So we went out to Spain and I got to meet him for the first time. Let's see, it was um, from 1997 to 2014. That's that's. A, I'm not even going to do the math, but it's a long time. I'd known him for that long. I'd never met him in person. So we finally got to meet, which was really wonderful. Another person uh, we brought on was Carter Goodrich. Carter Goodrich designed Ratatouille, Brave, Despicable Me, um, Monsters, Inc., Finding Nemo, The Crudes, uh, Coco. I mean, just he had, he's, he's just this amazing illustrator. 
his his designs really brought a sense of uh, Disney and Pixar to our movie, which was really cool. Uh, we it was a low budget film, twelve million dollars. We weren't expecting any big names, but we thought let's at least ask and see. And you know, we we were very clear we don't have a lot of money, but Ian McKellen really liked the script. So next thing we know, Ian McKellen is in our movie. And uh, now we had sent out letters to Sylvester Stallone and Danny DeVito because we just kind of spammed everybody in Hollywood. We didn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't hear anything uh, from, from anybody. But as soon as Ian McKellen signed on, boom, we got, uh, we got Sylvester Stallone signed on, Danny DeVito signed on, Raven Simone, Patrick Warburton, Wallace Shawn, Harvey Firestein, Gilbert Gottfried, and of course, my buddy Kevin Grievous from Underworld. I brought him on and I wrote a, a part especially for him. The two parts that we were missing was Owen and Zoe, the two leads. And um, my casting director, um, my casting director, uh, Jamie Thomason, he had recommended a guy named John Krasinski. Now this was 2014 and I had never seen The Office. So I had no idea who John Krasinski was. Um, I trusted him. So I said, sure, if you, if, you trust, if you think he's good, we'll do it. So I flew out from Nashville to Los Angeles. I met with him and I'm hanging out with him after the first session, which he was amazing by the way. Um, and he just was, as he's putting his jacket on, he's like, you know, he says, I just want to tell you, he says, my wife just loved your script, just thought it was really cute and adorable. Now, I didn't know who he was married to because, of course, I didn't know who he was. So I was like, oh, well, tell your wife, thank you for me. And um, fortunately, the microphones were hot and everybody came running in the room and asked, would your wife like to be in the movie? I was really confused until I found out that his wife was actually Emily Blunt. And uh, so next thing we know, Emily Blunt's in our movie, too, which was just amazing. So this is me hanging out with Ian McKellen and John Krasinski and everybody. And, and it was I, now suddenly I am a movie director. I'm a movie producer. I'm a movie writer. Um, and I'm just having the time of my life. Um, I got to pick my own music. So I got to work with Queen and Michael Buble and Huey Lewis and Code the Wet Sprock and Howard Jones and everything. It was an 80s kind of guy uh, dream. And uh, everybody was really, really cool. My wife in particular loved meeting Huey Lewis because I think she had a poster of him uh, in, her, in her room when she was growing up. So, uh, and then another cool thing we got to do, if you remember Joey's Pizza, we put Joey's Pizza in the movie. So if you see the movie, you'll see there's a scene where Emily and John, they're, they're racing somewhere in their minivan. And she goes, ah, why is it every time you get, you're in a hurry, you get stuck behind a pizza truck? Well, that's Joey's Pizza. And we actually have Joey in the movie for all the times that they helped us out. It was really, really cool. My son, Brendan, got to play uh, Owen, John Krasinski's character, at 12. And uh, for some reason, they're both Patriots fans. I have no idea why. He's from Tennessee, so I don't know why he's a Patriot fan, but there you go. Um, the other thing I got to do, and this was really fun, I kind of got to go back to my illustrator roots, and I got to, to uh, work with some, some wonderful illustrators to make movie posters, and I even got to make my own movie poster. So um, I finally got to kind of write that other bucket list thing off, which was to do a movie poster, uh, which was a lot of fun. So this was the, the painting that I did um, for the poster. And then finally, there was Bear McCreary. So Bear McCreary, you might know his music scores from The Walking Dead or Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Outlander or the latest Godzilla movie or a ton of other stuff. He is just amazing. So Bear McCreary is, was a kindred spirit. He was just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And uh, this is the uh, music, I'm sorry, this is the album cover I painted for him. Um, and the reason why, this is another bucket list, sorry, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but um, let me backtrack a little bit here. Bear McCreary uh, found out that my son Logan was a huge music uh, soundtrack buff, just loves soundtracks. And so every time he would come out, uh, Logan would just pepper him with questions about who he knows and you know what, what, what composers he's met, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when it came time to record, he set up the recording. He invited me and the family out to Los Angeles to go watch the orchestra perform the, uh, the recording, uh, which was really exciting, except for it was in the middle of the school year and Logan couldn't come out. Um, 
when Bear found out about it, he actually moved the entire orchestra to Nashville. And he recorded in Nashville so that way my son Logan could come after school every day and watch it. And I've never seen anything like that. It was the coolest thing ever. And, uh, and so there's a special place in, in my heart for Bear McCreary. And if you look in the back window, you'll see Logan is the turtle, his brother is the llama, and my wife is the, uh, the red panda. And watching, watching Bear as a bear, of course, for, uh, composing or uh, conducting the, uh, the orchestra, which is really cool. And um, the last thing uh, I'm going to show you guys, well, second to last thing I'm going to show you guys is um, I did a lot of sketches. I keep journals. And uh, so during the whole production, when I go to um, Valencia and I go to Spain or when I go to Los Angeles, I would just sit and sketch. I'm a very quiet person, I'm not a very outgoing person. And so I will like to sit quietly and just sketch. And so um, I kept kind of a journal of everything. Um, meeting John Krasinski and Raven Simone and hanging out with Tony and Carter or just the weird amount of shoes that I, uh, <laughs> that I bought over the years um, trying to pretend to be a producer. Um, but it was just a wonderful experience to look back at my notes and look back at the drawings uh, of meeting everybody. Um, so I love to, I love to kind of go back through these. Um, Everybody was so nice to me. Everybody signed autographs for me. They took pictures with me. I did all the geeky stuff you're supposed to do, all the nerdy stuff. And then, of course, there's the last day um, was with Bear McCreary and, and, the, uh, and the orchestra. And I would highly recommend if you ever draw, do not, do not, do not ever try to draw a French horn. Um, they were invented by Dr. Seuss and Willy Wonka, and uh, they're evil. So do not draw a French horn. Um, that is, Hector, I didn't hear from you once that whole time. Are you still there? I just want to make sure I'm not talking to myself. Oh, I'm right here. I'm, I'm in the chat the whole time, but. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I'm, actually, I'm actually saving questions for. Uh, That's fine. I, yeah. I've got, I've got a few behind the scenes videos I'm going to show you and then I will log off of this. So <clears throat> first up, uh, these are these are behind the scenes. These you'll see me most of the time. You'll see me in the reflection with my iPhone recording this. But um, you you all would do this too if you had the chance to make a movie. So you would totally record everything and be like, "Oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this." Um, so this was um, John and Emily. Uh, they clowned around a lot, and so this was um, uh, Emily is asking John. Um, what's in the, uh, the box of animal crackers. And of course, uh, John responds in typical joking around fashion. We of course didn't use this. So what's in the box? What's in the box? <laughs> <laughs> if any of you have seen that movie seven, uh, you'll get that. Uh, then we have Danny DeVito, who was just <laughs> fantastic. Oh, wow. Hey, yeah. um, hey kids. Who wants to guess how many pair of underwear I got on right now? <laughs> so you can hear us all laughing a lot of times because none of this stuff was scripted. This is just them just playing around, which we loved because we got a lot of jokes out of it. Animal Crackers Gilbert Gottfried. is uh, just a feel-good family film. And I think what they'll take from it, what they'll like most, is my performance. They'll forget everyone else who's in it and just remember me. They won't remember Danny DeVito or Sylvester Stallone or anyone else. They'll remember me. He's just so funny. Um, Beauty clowns. Samson is strongest of all. So that's that's my buddy Kevin. He, I, I wrote a character, Samson, and Kevin's favorite comic book character is the Hulk. So that's why I kind of wrote that puny clown, Samson is strongest of all. And I mean, seriously, listen to his voice. Animal. Puny clowns, Samson is strongest of all. I mean, come on, you gotta have him say that. Um, next up is of course, Patrick Warburton, who if you guys ever seen Emperor's New Groove, you know uh, who Kronk is. <laughs> What do I look like, an errand boy? Like some super handsome errand boy with 
shiny hair, big biceps, perfect lips, and dreamy eyes. <laughs> and then, of course, Raven Simone. It really tastes like lasagna. No spots, no hiccups. Woohoo! It really works. And Sylvester Stallone. I hold it true. What air befall, I feel it when I sorrow most. Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Bullet Man! Yeah! And then finally, this is the kind of goofing around that John and Emily did all day long. This was their first film ever together. This was long before A Quiet Place. It was their first film together and they would just goof around. I didn't write half of the stuff that they're talking about. John's making up stuff about baseball and whatever, but listen to the, listen to the fun. I didn't realize we were dealing with such a Debbie Downer guy. Sorry. Uh, so it's called a realist. I guess thing. I'm going to do it then. What? Yeah. I'm going to quit my father's company and I will rebuild this circus as Bob and Talia want Okay, Zoe, your dad's leaving you a company I don't and care. money. I don't so care. You can't, well, I've I, always loved this circus and I know you do too. It's a pipe I know you, I, you love it. I love baseball. You love it. I'm not playing baseball. You love this circus and <laughs> I'm you not just on the need Yankees. a little time to I love come baseball, around. not on the Yankees. It's not the same thing. It's Besides, similar. You know what? It's going to be the fun. Yankees have a stadium. It's going to be so. Mac, let's do it. Mac, you're let's not doing it. Let's go clean out no, no, no. some elephant poop. Mac, cover let's your ride ears. This is a family bareback, discussion. Mommy's not discussing. We she's get deciding. To see balloons every That's year. That's not what we talk about. Every day. Every day no, away. for better or worse, does not include circuses. <laughs> and that is that. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys like that. Really cool. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I yeah, love Raven her. is an alumni. Yeah. Uh, Raven would come, um, she was still attending classes when she was working, uh, and she would bring her watercolors. And uh, we were supposed to swap art, and she asked me to paint her as Charlie Chaplin, which I did, and I sent it to her. And she never sent me her painting. So she owes me a painting. So Scott, I got a couple questions to throw your way, if that's cool. Yeah. The first question that I, I took down um, was uh, Tiana Thomas out there asked a question that said, how do you prepare for all of that, especially with no writing, no experience writing scripts? So really pertaining to you, you know, getting, um, you had so much experience in your career already with different different fields, and then you started to do that script writing. So was, how did you prepare for it, you know, mentally, emotionally, um, you name yeah. it? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, and, and, and just remember, I'm not getting paid by the school to say what I'm about to say, <laughs> um, but having a good foundation helped me throughout my entire career. I could have never done video games or animation. All of the figure drawing, three hours of figure drawing a day that we had to do um, taught me anatomy, taught me to, to look, uh, you know, um, the, the color theory, the, the um, classes, the design classes, all of that gave me a good foundation. Then it was just the crazy Forrest Gump type of career that I had going from video games to comic books, to children's books, to movies, to TV, um, just every little bit, I just drew upon that, that experience um, to kind of get there. But really um, the biggest thing is to just do it. Um, I, I can't express that enough is to not be afraid of failing. Failure is a part of being an artist. Um, every single time you put a paintbrush to, to a canvas or you, you, you know, uh, if you're a writer or anything, you're gonna fail. That's, that's part of the whole um, experience of being an artist is failing. So once you don't feel, fear failure, it makes it a whole lot easier to try these things. That's awesome. Um, so, uh, 
<clears throat> question from uh, Josephine out there. Uh, so what Josephine asked was, how do you keep inspired during coronavirus and or other difficult <laughs> times? I find it very discouraging uh, to keep at it this year. Oh, man. Yeah, I agree. I agree, which is why I have these here. Um, I have been filling up these sketchbooks with, um, I've been doing, you know, a, a, a painting a day um, of sketches and notes and just keeping journals and, um, and whatnot. So I, I, I'll sketch anything. I'll do, this is, I'm, I was drawing Hamilton. Um, and before that, you know, we would, you know, just drive to Clarksville uh, and sketch, but I try to fill, fill up sketchbooks. I mean, I've got probably six or seven of these. I've been doing sometimes two paintings a day um, just, to, just to keep working. And, uh, and so essentially make art, you know, write. Uh, just just don't, don't let something like this, I mean, if it's gonna be another six months, if it's gonna be another year, fill up sketchbooks, fill up um, journals. Um, my wife's not an artist and she's been filling up journals. Um, make a puppet show. Uh, uh, make, I, I've, I've made a couple of music videos. Um, you know, we've, we've learned to design puppets, you know, do stop motion. Um, on this year and think of how you did nothing, how you didn't grow in any way. And so I've been just really practicing my watercolors and practicing my sketches. And I miss writing, I miss working on the movies and, and, uh, and I hope I can do another one. But right now I just have to keep being positive and just keep creating. Um, every artist should feel that drive to just keep creating. Doesn't matter if it's with crayons or, or film or, or writing or, or paper or whatever it is, just keep creating. Yeah, you know, I think that <laughs> that may answer a couple of the other questions that, um, that came through. Because uh, one person actually had an interesting question that said, uh, how do you know if you're practicing art or animation, illustration, et cetera, correctly? It's a very interesting question. Yeah, I mean, um, correctly is a, <laughs> there is no correct in art. There is no correct. Um, I mean, uh, off the top of my head, look at Picasso. Um, look at, look at, you know, two eyes on one side of the head. I mean, uh, look at um, animated films. Uh, l let's take uh, the film Hoodwinked. Um, was not a Pixar quality film, but did really, really well. Um, there, you can, I think people can see your passion in what you're doing. And um, while you should always strive to become a better artist, if you find something that you love and that you're good at and that people also seem to love, then keep, keep doing that. Um, but uh, that's the hard thing with being an artist um, is I love, let, let's take Spider-Man. I loved Spider-Man and that's all I want to do. My work just wasn't good enough for Marvel Comics. It just wasn't. And I had to keep going back for 15 years until I found something. Uh, you can call it a, a, a gimmick or whatever that, that at least gave me that job. I couldn't make a career out of it because it just wasn't in my talent pool. Uh, it, just, it just wasn't. But um, you, you do have to adapt. You have to adapt to what uh, the audience wants what what clients want and so it's it is really hard on one hand you want to say just do what you love but on the other hand if you want to make a living at it you have to see a need you have to see an audience and be able to fill that that niche uh for for those people so it, it is it is really hard because it, it is kind of it's contradictory man i'm trying to keep up with so many questions so um... <laughs> There were, there was probably six variations of this question and they're all related to creativity block, um, getting stuck, how do I get through writer's block, uh, character development block, they're all literally variations of the same question. So when you say lack of a better word, 
having a creative block, what are some of the things you do to maybe step away and come back fresh and be ready to continue to keep your ideas moving forward? I think a creative block is not necessarily a creative block. I think it's, it's, you're not performing at the level that you want to perform. And, and so um, I know what I want to write. I know what I want to draw and I'm just not able to do it at that level. Like what's in my mind is not coming out on the paper. You, you never lose your ability to draw or to write. So just keep doing it, write something else, draw something else. You, you might not like what you write, but you're going to, in those mistakes and in those things, you're going to get through it by doing it. And um, it, it's, it's the same with pretty much anything in life. You know, you, there's that part of you that always is going to tell you, you can't do it at some, some, everybody just gets run down and you're just like, I just can't do it anymore. Or I'm just not feeling it. But if this is what you want to do as a career, there needs to be a part of you that says, I can't not do it. I mean, I, I can't go to bed at night knowing I didn't create some sort of art. Doesn't matter if I like it or not. I've got a pile of art that no one's ever going to see. <laughs> and that's the stuff that I didn't throw away. You just still create the art. Um, one of the things I've been doing is I've been trying to post stuff uh, online, try to post stuff on TikTok or Instagram, just because I want to get it out there. Um, so that way I don't hide behind it. You know, I just don't do it for myself. Um, I want to show the stuff that is in my mind, mediocre and, uh, and just kind of work through some of that stuff. Um, but there, the writer's block or the, the, the artist block that you're going to have is just that you're not hitting on all cylinders. You're not running at, at your hundred percent. And, and that happens to us all the time. Just keep working through it. Just keep doing it. Create art because you want to create art. Don't worry about whether you're creating the art you want to create, or you're, you're, you're not going at the, the level that you want to. That's where the artist block comes from. All right. So question from uh, Ronald Martin out there. So he said, uh, Long story short, really inspiring to hear your story. Uh, and his question was uh, pertaining to getting your foot in the industry. And there's actually several questions about how do I get started? How do I, what's your advice on getting started? How do I get my name out there? But his specific question was getting your foot in the industry. How do you get into the industry when you live away from it? Would I have to take a leap of faith, yeah. move? to follow my dreams? What should I do? So I think geographically, Ronald, I think is probably referring to saying he doesn't really live in an area where this industry is very much relevant, but, uh, you know, do I, I'm in Franklin, Tennessee, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I mean, and, and Jaime was in Valencia, Spain, <laughs> you know, uh, the thing is, is, um, I, with everything, I think I made the industry come to me. Um, whether it would be illustration or movies or TV or whatever, is I, I almost always worked at home. You know, when I worked in video games, you worked at the, at the game company. It really does depend on the career you want. You know, if you want to be an animator uh, for Pixar, you're going to have to move to Pixar. You know, if you want if you want to work at a particular company, chances are you're going to have to do that. But if you just want to make movies make movies. You can make a movie right now. You can put it up on YouTube and you could do it again tomorrow and you can keep doing it. Um, so it, it really depends on where you want to work. And that's, that's your, your answer to your geographical question. But I, I have my own studio and my own studio is me and my wife. And then uh, when we're making the movie, I'm working with Jaime and his team in Spain. And um, I don't want to move to Los Angeles. I don't want to uh, move anywhere. I, I like working from home. I don't, I, I mean, I, I live in a hobbit hole. Um, I, I don't want to, to, to work with other people. So you can do your own stuff. And there's so many people now um, who are able to make a lot of money, make a really good living using social media, using TikTok, using YouTube and whatever. So if you have a story to tell, or if you have characters that you want to bring to life, or you have books that you want to write or whatever it might be, 
world is open to you to do it from your home. You just need to, to be persistent um, and adapt. If you want to look like Pixar animation, either you have to have the money to pay for it, or you're going to have to have a bunch of friends who are willing to work for free who are really talented, or you have to give up on the whole Pixar animation. You have to come up with something like a different style, something with use puppets. I just, my son and I, we made a music video for uh, Toe the Wet Sprocket using puppets uh, because why the heck not? And for a hundred dollars, we got felt and buttons and hats and stuff. And we, we made little characters and it's fun. And uh, so just be creative with that and tell their stories how you want to. Um, hey, so as an illustrator, uh, some people were asking for some uh, tips on some good drawing exercises. I actually was telling them in the chat, I used to take a course from a Disney animator and one of our warmups was, we used to stack different size boxes on top of each other. And you know, we would do like perspective drawing, proportion balance mm. of that nature. Do you have any cool exercises that you do to warm up when you're getting started? Um. I, I, I just try to, to just draw something. Um, I've never been good at drawing from my head or at least not to the quality that I'd like. And so for me, I always need to look at something to draw it. And so if I'm drawing every day, I'm drawing from a photo every day. I love to go places and draw. So that, that gets me to start drawing uh, uh, environments and uh, you know the perspective and everything like that. But um, no, for me, for me, it's always just have enough inspirational pictures to draw from. And then I just, uh, you know, whether it's the Lord of the Rings or it's Hamilton or whatever it is, and I'll just go, okay, I'm going to do 12 drawings. You know, uh, I'm just going to run through the cast. I'm just going to draw that stuff and I'll fill up sketchbooks and, and, uh, and, and that'll be fun. But the other thing is also to keep a sketchbook with you. Let's assume COVID's over and you're going out to dinner and I, I bring sketchbooks with me to dinner and I'll draw the people I'm with and I'll draw, you know, the places that we go and, you know, if we're going out to ice cream and I'll go sit down while the kids are eating ice cream and I'll just draw. And so just draw, 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 draw. I don't think, um, again, figure drawing and, and all is, is wonderful, but if you don't have that available, we have the internet. Um, so as it pertains to software, uh, any animation software you recommend or anything that maybe you've been seeing in the industry right now? I, I can't say for animation because I haven't touched animation in probably a decade, but uh, I know we originally started off in 3D Studio Max because that was what you know we were kind of using, what Jaime and I were using for the most part as Blue Dream Studios. But when we started the movie, he really realized he had to move over to Maya. And, uh, and so they, they moved to Maya on that, but, um, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't answer any other, Jaime would be a better one to answer that question for, for day-to-day -day animation software. Yeah, I would tell you, uh, right now, you know, we teach a lot of Maya to answer the question from the school perspective. Uh, you see, uh, yeah. eBrush out there. I mean, there's a lot of different things. I mean, the one thing I would tell any students though, is that, it's really the skill you're looking for. Software is always going to change. It's always going to upgrade. It's just a tool. Um, I think a lot of times people get really hung up in software. And don't get me wrong, it's it's really important to know that. It's really the skill of illustration, the skill of animation that helps you yeah. to look at the software as a tool, not really what's making you good at it, if that makes sense. Yeah. You, you the, the thing about animation is this. the The... Because, because again, I never took an animation course in my life. I was an animator for half of it. But I never took a single animation course. Animation is acting, and um, you have to be able to know how a body moves. You have to to be able to to um, uh, there's the 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 basics of animating, and then there's the acting of animating. And really, you're given a scene, you're given storyboards, and you're given sound. And you have to you have to come up with how the character is going to express that dialogue. You know, if you're getting Ian McKellen speaking a line, um, you don't want that body moving all about. It's not bouncy. It's not Daffy Duck. You know, you really, really want to be able to get into that character 
And you really want to be able to understand the emotions and understand um, the drama of it, the cinematography of it. So there's a lot that goes into it more so than just the basics of moving keyframes around. Um, you really want to study acting. Uh, I, I, I can't express that enough. As a, as a director and as an animator, I want to see somebody really, really bring that scene to life with their acting. Um, every, everybody that we worked with had the technical skills to put the keyframes in and to make the character seem believable. Could they act? And, uh, and so study, study film, study people, see how people move, see how people react, draw them, you know, get those, those, uh, that, that emotion, get, get, you know, the, the subtleties, the way people blink, the way people tilt their head, you know, all of that stuff is really important. Hey, so, uh, oh, I, I messed up my email. Sorry about that. Let me see. <laughs> you know, my, my type, my typo to well typed ratio is still pretty healthy though, but I, I do. <laughs> uh, so I've had some questions that are, I think align, uh, they're all kind of, you know, aligned here. And I think it, it has more to do with, uh, with really just like passion, you know, and I, I can, I listen to your whole story, you know, as far as what you were saying about since you were a child and Spider-Man and loving to draw, um, but I guess here's the million dollar question. Uh, how did you get the faith and the courage to believe in yourself to pursue that rather than to say, oh, this is a hobby. I'm going to try to go and do something that's a little bit more traditional or safe. Uh, what was it in you that, that pushed you to say, I'm going to go for it. I'm all in. Oh, I have no faith in myself. Um, I have no confidence in myself. I'm just not afraid of failing. Um, I, I, I'll crash and burn and that's just another lesson to learn from. And, uh, I, you, you, you don't need to have, I I'm a shy person. Um, you know, I, I had to take a whole bunch of Pepto Bismol before getting on this call. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm not, um, an outgoing confident person, um, making a movie and traveling to London and Spain and, and everything was terrifying, but it, it, it was an opportunity. There was no way I was going to pass up. And so you, you figure out a way to do it, but really you don't need to have confidence in yourself. I mean, as an artist, I, I never have confidence in any of my paintings. I don't have confidence in my writing, uh, in the movie that I made, in any of the books that I wrote. Um, I, I, I just did them because I had to. I did them because I'm an artist and because I want to do it. And if this book isn't very good, then I'll learn from it and I'll write a better one. But I look at it as I've got to make a hundred bad movies till I finally write a, you know, make a movie that I like. I've got to do a hundred bad paintings till I do a painting that I like. Same thing with books, same thing with everything else. You just kind of have to get through the bad ones to get to where you start to feel comfortable with them. And I'm hoping that when I die at the ripe old age of 147, um, that I still am hoping that my next painting is gonna be my best, that my next whatever it is is gonna be my best. I, I hope I'm always striving to be better and I'm always striving to learn. And uh, so I, 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 in a lot of ways, feel that confidence is the enemy of an artist. Um, I, I, th I think you need to be um, afraid. You need to be curious. You need to be wondering what, what's going to happen when I apply this paint to the, to the canvas. I have no idea. I hope it comes out like the last one. I hope it's as good. Or, but I, I think you really need to just not worry about whether you're going to fail. Know that you're going to fail. I mean, I could point out all of the failures on this film. I could point out all the failures on every single painting that I'm posting on TikTok and Instagram. Um, everything has failures to it. Everything is, this part is, isn't that good. This part isn't that good. And uh, so just, just be comfortable in that failure and know that it's a part of growing as an artist. Well, we had a lot of people that said uh, they definitely relate to you, so. 
So there's that. Unite my fellow slide. introverts. Well, it was a landslide of introverts, <laughs> and then there was a couple like, I'm an extrovert, I'm an extrovert. So uh, <laughs> just tell you, there's a place in the world for all of us. So don't, you know, yeah, uh, don't be afraid to be introverted. I saw a couple questions um, asking about uh, something about the difference between uh, digital and traditional. Did you see any of those or? Yeah, the thing. I, mean, I just glanced. But... Go ahead. It's moving so fast. I'm keeping up with it as much as I can. Yeah. Um, so, so some of you had asked just essentially what my thoughts are between digital and traditional, and um, I, I've done both. You know, I've, I've, uh, I, I really do. What I love about digital is um, the the way that you're able to manipulate something till you get it exactly the way you want to. What I love about traditional is you're stuck with it. Um, and you also just don't know how it's gonna come out. Uh, one thing, having an undo button, you lose out on a lot of those mistakes that um, as a traditional artist, you have to learn to accept and sometimes you learn to love. Uh, and so um, I think you, you it, it's, it's kind of like time traveling if you're digital, you know, you, you don't know how, you know, if you do, you know, six paintings uh, digitally and you, every time you get to something you don't like, you undo it. Um, and so you, I feel like you might stagnate because all of your illustrations come out the same. Whereas if you're a traditional artist and you do six paintings and there's something you don't like, you might become, you might come to love the mistakes and incorporate that into your, into your style, or you might learn how to avoid them. And in doing so, um, you know, incorporate that into your style. So I, I obviously there's no difference um, as far as uh, both are art, but um, as far as uh, traditional, I like the, the not knowing and I like having to live with it because if I, I would undo forever if I was doing traditional, I would just keep on doing it till I was happy. Uh, let me see here. I have I had a question that I took down here. Let me let me go back to that real quick. Sorry, Scott. So would you encourage more creators to focus on adapting their own material for film? Question from Ed, Edwin out there. Would yeah, I mean, I... Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Kevin was Kevin Grievous was really, really smart in telling me to just write my own screenplay, and um, <clears throat> and I really think that just getting used to making your own stories, um, I think, is the best thing. Again, it's not for everybody. Some people thrive with um, going to a nine to five job and working side by side with other artists and, and uh, working for uh, a studio. Some people aren't storytellers. Some people are incredible storyboard artists or character designers or, or animators or modelers and they're not storytellers. And that's perfectly fine because that's just not your thing. In my case, I have stories that I wanna tell. I have, I just, I, I, my mind is always coming up with new stuff. I want to tell stories about aliens and I want to tell stories about dinosaurs and pirates and, and I just want to do stuff like that. <clears throat> so depending on what you want to do, I would say, you know, um, it, it really just depends on, the, on your career choice. Uh, question for you, you're going to like this one. Uh... <laughs> Should an illustrator have many illustration styles or one consistent style? Mm. I think one consistent style, which is not me. Um, I'm, I'm all over the place. Um, but I think if you're going to sell yourself, uh, it's the same thing with acting. It's the same thing with music. It's the same thing with writing. If you're the guy who writes horror, that's what they want to hire you for. I mean, a good example is Bear McCreary, our composer. He was the horror guy. He wrote Walking Dead. He wrote, um, got a ton of other horror stuff, you know, or, or just the drama and horror stuff, Black Sails, Outlander, whatever. 
he never did a kid stuff, but he had a he had a daughter, and he really wanted to do this. He wanted to break the mold because no one would hire him to do a kid's animated movie. And and I think um, people are going to judge you by your your portfolio. And uh, it's good to be able to do everything. As an illustrator, you need to be able to to do everything, and it's good to be able to show that. But as far as styles go. Um, it's, I think I think professionally it's a good thing to have a style that people can easily notice and and pick up on and say that's this person's art and uh, at least that's my my thought all right you're gonna love this right when you started talking like four people at the same time wrote how do you find your own style ah uh, yeah um I, I don't know if I have a style. And it's funny because I have friends who said, oh, I saw the, you, this cover you did. I immediately knew it was you. And I go, how? Because it was bad? I mean, is that how you know it's me? And, and, but they, they, they can tell my style. And so I, I honestly don't know. I don't know if that's something that you're, you're ever able to, to know. Now, there might be a gimmick. Um, like I've been adding <laughs> little red noses to my character, I mean, just a little more red. And my mom hates it. She says, they all look like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Stop adding those little red noses. So there's like little gimmicks you can add um, to your art that will separate it. And if people seem to like it, that's a good thing. It could be more caricature or whatever. But honestly, I don't know if you ever do, unless you purposely decide to do something that is way out there. Um, I think you just, your art just becomes your art and people seem to notice it. Yeah, I always tell the students to just, just practice. Like your style kind of finds you. Um, yeah. You, you tend to develop and you tend to see what you're good at. I think a lot of times too, especially, you know, I see a lot of these students that are in high school and, you know, um, fortunately I, I get a chance to meet students all over the place and, I get a lot of these questions from students. So don't feel weird if you're feeling these feelings. It's pretty normal. But I would tell you that if you have a passion and an interest, um, the more that you get exposed to the different things within that industry, you tend to start to gravitate toward the things that you enjoy, the things you're better at, and start to shape that identity. So I would just tell you, as long as you're sailing in the general direction, you'll find your place. You'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, hey, Scott, question for you. So what's next on your plate? Um, and uh, we've also had some questions about your door in the back. <laughs> um, well, this is this is the Hobbit Hall. Um, it is officially a Hobbit Hall. All right. There was a, a Hobbit Hall. About that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it's, oops, sorry, wrong way. It's a great place to work. We kind of just, it's, it was our basement and uh, and we just kind of took a lot of paint and those those beams are all styrofoam and um, the walls are painted to look like wood and everything. So it's kind of like a movie set really, um, but it's a wonderful place to work. Um, as for my next project, <clears throat> I'm hoping to do pet robots and uh, that would be uh, a lot of fun to do. Um, I've already written the script for it and uh, I think we're going to get the money for it. It's just, like I said, COVID has really kind of screwed everything up. So we'll see. But it'd be fun to do robots next. That's awesome. Uh, students, so I tried to keep up with as many questions as you had. So uh, please feel free to send some more through. I, I was going as fast as I can. By the time I'd copy one, uh, uh, another one would come in and knock it out of my spot. So. Yeah, and I, I've seen a lot of people sharing their Instas and whatever, so I'll share mine again. It's, uh, I am at Sava Art, and you can find that on TikTok and Instagram. Hey, so, uh, so Scott, um, question for you. Um, so what advice would you give to these students that I guess that are – you know, maybe they're, they're just trying to figure out this industry. They're trying to figure out illustration, film, writing. I would tell you, 
especially younger students, they're interested in so many things and that's normal. I think they, they get yeah. panic attacks because they're interested in so many things. And I actually think you're the perfect guy for this because of, you know, meeting with you last night, you're like, I'm still interested in a lot of things and doing different things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I don't think, I don't think it's, it's a, I don't, I don't think you're 17, 18 years old and you've got to decide what you're going to do for the rest of your life. I don't think it's like that. I think you're deciding what you're going to do next. That's all you're doing. And mm-hmm. um, it, it, you can, you can sign up for animation. You could sign up for uh, illustration. You could sign up for whatever it is. And if you don't like it, you could change. If you like it for five years. Great. If you, I mean, again, I'm, I'm the poster child for that. I, I, while I was still in school for illustration, I got into video games. Um, and, and then I got a, there was a game designer and then I left that for comic books and then I left that for movies and I left that for TV. And so uh, again, there's, there's no rules about this. Um, just make yourself happy and also be good at what you do and also make sure that you, you know, are able to make a living doing it. Um, and I know those are, those are, it's a lot to think about, but for now, figure out what's going to make you happy now and, and then pursue that. And hopefully the, the, the rest of that will fall into place. Um, so question, do I ever not want to draw, but do it anyways? Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, it's rare because I actually really do love to draw. Um, I love to just, and, and like I said, there's just days where, where you're just not feeling up for it. And, and sometimes I just don't, but I think that was the other thing of doing challenges. Like I did the Inktober or Arttober challenge where you did, you know, painting a day or an illustration a day or something. Um, I think putting yourself out there publicly saying, I'm going to do this and having people kind of cheer you on um, makes you draw on those days that you weren't going to do it, you know, because if no one's really watching, who's going to know. So I think there's a part of me that likes putting that stuff out there publicly and, um, and saying, yep, I'm going to draw every day. I'm going to draw every day. I'm going to draw every day. And, and you do it. So um, I think sometimes just challenging yourself gets you through that. Somebody had a question that said, how do I know um, if this is an interest or if this is a passion? Um, I think uh, a passion is something you want to do every morning. Um, I wake up, my wife hates it. Uh, you know, for We've been married almost 28 years. And, uh, and I wake up every morning at 6 a.m. And I go, now granted, I get to come down to a hobbit hole. So that's kind of cool. But um, I get up and I can't wait to come down and work. And I love painting and I love, you know, working on the movies and whatnot. So I, th- I think um, if it's something you, you can't wait to get up and do, then that's definitely a passion. Um, so um, pursue that. I, and, and, and me being a dad too, my, my boys are, you know, high school seniors. Um, you can have a passion for skateboarding, but you know you're not good enough to be a professional skateboarder. You might have to go and find something else that you're passionate about to do as a career. So um, it is not a, this isn't a fairy tale. Just because you're passionate about, you know, uh, graffiti art um, doesn't mean you're going to be able to make a career at it. There might be one or two people who can, but you have to be very, very, very um, clear to yourself and honest with yourself as to which one of your passions you think you can make a career out of. And so you definitely want to consult people who do like what I'm doing or the school and say, can I make a career of this passion? And if you can find a career of it, great. That's a, that's a win. But if not, it doesn't mean you don't have to, you, you can't still do it. Look, I'm not making money off of my watercolor, you know, things, all these sketches that I'm doing, I'm not making money off of it. That's my passion. Um, it's not my, my true love uh, uh, making movies, but honestly, that's where I'll make my money is making the movies. It's a lot of fun. 
and it's a it's a wonderful career but i wake up every morning wanting to paint and i can't make a living at it so i make movies so i found a second passion not as much as the first found a second passion that um i can make a career of and so i think you you got to be realistic with the stuff that you really 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 want to do can you make a career of it you you should try it you should absolutely try i tried being an illustrator and i just wasn't i just didn't have it um but i was able to make a career in video games and movies and 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 whatnot and so that was still a really cool thing and i still get to do i basically i get a second passion i hope that helps Mm -hmm. (laughs) do you have a favorite spider-man variation there is spider-man variation um i always love the black costume you know the one from secret wars uh, and, uh, I thought that, I mean, of course the, 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 the original traditional is, is the best, but, um, the black costume was always really kind of cool. I just saw the commercial today. before it became venom. Oh yeah. I just saw the commercial today for the, the PlayStation five Spider-Man game. Look pretty cool. Oh yeah. That looks amazing. Yeah. It's, I love when you did the uh, the the primal rage because I'm actually of the age group where I used to play that on like uh, Super Nintendo all the time. Oh, really? <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've come across it in some of those art, you know, those you know arcade places that you know they they put together nowadays. But I've come across it a couple of times. But that's like a that's like a diamond in the rough when you find the machine nowadays. It really is. It really is. And. Uh... You know, I, I, I miss arcade games. Um, you know, I, I love that. But uh, God, the games that we have now on PlayStations and PC, I mean, it's just amazing. So do I ever think about working on games now? Um, no, not really. I mean, I, I, uh, there's games I would like people to make um, that they haven't yet. Um, so there's a part of me that just wants to go step aside, make this kind of game. But um, no, I, I play one game every day and that's Overwatch just because I, I just, it's just fun and I could play for 20 minutes and, and, uh, and I love to do that. And then I, I beat Legends of Zelda, uh, was it Breath of the Wild um, last year? And I'm waiting for the, <clears throat> there's a new one coming out, I think like next week. Yeah, Overwatch is amazing. I love it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm forever stuck in platinum and I'm okay with it. Uh, but I, I just, I love it. I love playing it. And, uh, I think it's okay. We got the kids into world of Warcraft for a while and that was really fun. And uh, it was a good thing to do with the family, all four of us. Um, I wish, I wish, I wish they would, uh, create a world of Warcraft where, you know, okay, now we're going to go and there's going to be just a different world. I mean, because every time you go, you're going back to the same places and after a while it kind of gets boring. But I, I always thought World of Warcraft was wonderfully done. <clears throat> and if you guys are ever on Overwatch on the PC, S. Sava is my name. So look for me. I'd be happy to play with you. So someone said that they're they're worried about drawing too much um, and potentially losing their passion or their their passion for creating art. Um, so I'm not. I guess the way that the question is phrased is that uh, I don't want to draw at all because it feels overwhelming. Do you ever feel overwhelmed by the prospect of having a lot of work? I'm afraid I'll lose my love of creating art. Um, You should never feel afraid of losing your love of creating art, because if you do, then then you do. Um, You know, that just means that you're done with that part of your life and you're moving on to something else. I'm assuming you find something else that you're passionate about. Uh, If if that's going to happen, it's going to happen. but uh, it's, it's, I'll say it. Um, but if you were afraid of, like you can't draw yourself into, into um, dispassionate. <laughs> You're, or you can't 
like uh, draw yourself out of being an artist. Um, you know, really what you need to do is just draw because you want to. Um, if you don't want to draw, then, then that's not really the thing for you. That's the great thing about being who you are at the time that this is. You don't have to draw. You could learn to sculpt. You could be a rigger. You could be a colorist. You could be, I mean, there's so many things. There's so many wonderful, wonderful uh, careers that are in the artistic field that you don't have to be a, 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 someone who draws. And so I, I, you know, animators don't have to draw. Um, so I, I would say, don't, don't be worried about it. If, if for any reason, you're just not feeling like you want to draw, don't. You know, just don't pursue an, a career where you have to draw, you know, because if, if so, then you do need to draw. And, and if it's if it's a real pain, then then, you know, find something else. Hey, Scott, I have a question for you on your film uh, when you were working on Animal Crackers. So what what, if any, um, participation, work, oversight, any any of the above did you have with the animation process? And what was that like for you to well, I, develop these characters and see the animation process take place? It was great. It was great. I mean, I, I was, because I wrote it and I also directed it and I also produced it and I also art directed it. So you know, it was, I was kind of involved in everything. Um, the great thing was, is that Jaime out in Spain, he would make sure that the animation was, like he would do 90% of the notes before I would get to see it. So he would make sure it was good. He would make sure I wasn't, I wasn't giving like, hey, this leg's over in the wrong spot or there's not enough weight. To... So I would get really good animation to look at. And uh, so every morning I would wake up and there'd be 20, 30, 40 shots for me to look at. And I get to watch them and give my notes and then send it back. So as a director, all I was doing was I was seeing, is the acting good? Is this really fitting what I had hoped for the scene to be, what the actors had brought to this, to the story, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and so I think it was really good because um, when you work with talented people, you don't have to do their work for them too. Um, I didn't have to tell Danny DeVito how to play a clown. He just did, you know, he knew it better than I did. So I just got to sit back and enjoy it any notes I would give would be, hey, do you think he should say this because in the story he's doing that? And then Danny would come back and go, yeah, I don't know, let's, let's give that a shot. And then we, we would kind of give it a shot and then see if that worked. But it was never telling him how to do his job. It was always, hey, what do you think would work better as part of the story? And so when we get to the animation, it was, hey, this animation is really well done. Do you think that Ian McKellen is, is his character is, is inflecting this word enough to where we should have him do this, or should he tilt his head a little bit there? And, oh, okay, yeah, we'll try that. So it was really more collaborative, um, which, was, which is the best way to work. Um, making a movie is 100% collaborative. It's not like doing a painting. Um, you, you have 120 people working with you. And, uh, and so it, it's, it's a really amazing experience. To, it, it's so crazy having going going into a studio and listening to Sylvester Stallone, who I grew up with, you know, reading lines that you wrote. Like I wrote that. I I wrote that, you know, sitting in my hobbit hole, I wrote this. And now Rocky is or Gandalf, you know, is is is, is saying the lines that I wrote. And so it, it is really, really an amazing experience. And to watch uh, 120 people come together and produce art based on something that came out of your head um, is an is a humbling experience. Um, so good question from Edwin out there. It said, how are you able to network well enough um, for funding when you were um, basically relatively unknown, especially with a foreign entity? This question? Yeah, I'm still unknown, by the way. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I didn't. Um, 
I, I actually asked every family member, every friend, you know, anybody who has $10 million I can borrow. So uh, imagine doing that. And then they start asking friends and then they start asking friends and they start asking friends. And essentially it took us three years until we found, and it was just sheer chance. Uh, a guy I had known at Atari games named Harry mock was at a party in Los Angeles. He met a guy from Australia who knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who knew two guys who knew a gal who knew a guy who knew two gals who worked for this woman in China and she invested money. And so it was just this impossibly long chain of people. I had no connection to them at all. And yet it happened. So um, you really just have to, it could have just as easily never happened. It really could have. Um, but had, had I not tried, it never would have happened. Um, was there a saying, you know, by the basketball players saying, you know, you miss a hundred percent of the, the free throws you never take. No. So um, if you don't try, it's never going to happen. So it doesn't matter where you live. It does. There's people with money all over the world. If you have a good story idea and um, preferably if you're a good salesman, because I'm not a good salesman. If you know somebody who can sell, as they sell, uh, say you can sell uh, ice to Eskimos. If, if there's somebody who, who you know who can do that, get that person to help you make uh, uh, find the money. That, uh, no, that's good advice though. I think that, you know, there's things I try to talk to the students about Scott all the time. And it's, it really has a lot more to do with, with the work ethic side of things. I think that, um, you know, there's, there's, there's chance in this life, there's luck, call whatever you want to believe in, but you definitely see some common attributes with people that are successful or that they achieve their goals. And it's really just being relentless, working hard, being dedicated, uh, always trying. And I thought one of the coolest things I've heard in a long time is what you were saying. You were like, Oh, I, I'm just, I'm okay with failing and I'm okay with that. And I, and it doesn't mean that you're rooting to fail. You're just accepting the fact that that may be an outcome, but that's not going to change you from continuing to try and continuing yeah. to be successful. So, and I think there's a different, well, look, look at, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Look at, look at, look at working out um, to build muscle. You're pushing your, muscles to the point to where they fail where they can't lift and and you grow by failing every time you work out you grow by by having your muscles quit and they just they they, they can't accomplish what you're asking them to do and and then they go back they restitch themselves together and they become stronger and i think you really need to um look at your art in that way and say look i'm not going to improve unless i fail it's just, it, it's, it's not failure. You're just, you have to work through the process. You have to get stronger. You have to, you know, finish a painting and put it aside, finish another painting and finish the book or whatever it is that you're doing and put it aside. Um, you have to do that to grow. If you don't, um, you're never going to grow in the same way a, a bodybuilder is never going to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's actually something uh, a quote that I've I've heard. Um, actually, my favorite basketball player ever was Kobe Bryant, and he said that part of his success was being in love with the process, and that's what uh, that's what he attributed his success to was falling in love with the process. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it's it's. Um, I could look at every single thing I've done. And, and look at it and say, was it a success? Was Primal Rage a success? Was Spider-Man a success? Was Animal Crackers a success? Um, compared to what? You know, uh, compared to Despicable Me, which made a billion dollars per film, you know? No, it wasn't. We're not even close, you know? I, I don't, I, it, it's not a matter of successes. It was a matter of the journey of making the film. That's it. I, you know, I, I, I and, and it's the journey of, I, I didn't tell you guys how many issues of Spider-Man we sold or how well animal crackers did or how well, I didn't, I, I didn't mention once about the successes of any of those things. 
It was the journey of making those things. When I look back on my life and when all of you look back on your life, you're not going to look back on whether you were number one at whatever it is you did. You look back on the experiences that you had in creating the stories or, or, or whatever jobs you're going to do. It's going to be that. Um, I, I, I think we need to stop looking at things as successes and failures and start looking at them as part of the journey. Yeah, well said. Thank you. <laughs> you guys well, are all making friends. I feel left out. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, no one's adding me, you know, whatever. <laughs> I better better get off this and have like 100, 100 new uh, friends on Instagram and TikTok. Yeah, all you see is pictures of my, <laughs> it's not that cool. Um, that's funny. But uh, yeah, hey, Scott, it's been it's been amazing having you. I mean, it's been a really cool time just talking and hearing your story. And uh, I'm super excited to catch the, uh, the Animal Crackers film. And I, I'm looking forward to starring in Pet Robots. It's going to be amazing. Uh, can you <laughs> You're going to be the star. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. Hey, in all seriousness, though, no, it's, it's really great to have you. And I think it's cool just to have people you know, to talk about their experiences, I think it really does go a long way. Cause I know, um, I remember being at that point in high school, I remember being that point in college where you're just like, what am I gonna do? And what, where do I land? And uh, I, there's just something about that leap of faith where you have to believe in yourself and who you are and what it is that you're gonna be doing. Um, so that's why I always tell everybody, I mean, you go for it, do, it, do something that you're gonna enjoy doing, do something you're gonna be passionate about. Um, if there's anything that we can do as an institution to try to help you to do that, then great. Even if it's not this school and we at least put you on a train switch to put you on track to do something that you're going to enjoy with your life, I, I'd be more than happy uh, to, to spend the time to do that for anybody out there too. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I mean, it, 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 the Academy of Art was such an amazing experience and it was such a wonderful foundation that allowed me to do all of these things. Um, I can't thank everybody enough and uh and so yeah this was this was just so fun to do and uh and i hope somehow we inspired some of these youngins to uh to pursue storytelling and art and video games and movies and and anything else and you guys can find me out there and ask me any other questions and uh i'd love to see your art and uh don't be afraid to show it to me and thank you all for coming out yeah. Hey, one big shout out to Scott. One more time, folks in the chat, if you want to say thank you. Uh, hey, Scott, do you mind putting in your IG one more time or your info? I know you're going to get a lot of... Yeah, yeah. Just here, look up uh, Asava. Oops. So cool. Man. And uh, I got to tell you, Scott, I do this all the time, but your story is awesome, man. I, I love it. And it's it's just so cool. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when we talked last night, I thought Thank that you. was one of the coolest things is when you were just saying, I don't know what I am. I just do things. I just keep moving and doing stuff. And uh, I thought that was one of the coolest things is that you're, you're always finding a way to grow and expand and do new things. And to me, that's that's inspirational, man. I think that's just really cool that you're such a fighter. And I thought that that Joe's Pizza shout out was probably one of the most humbling and cool things I've seen somebody do is to definitely not uh, for those people that helped you. I thought I actually thought that this guy is a really cool guy to even just make sure that he gave back that way. Really cool. Oh, you, do you know it's been 10 years and they still won't charge us for a pizza? <laughs> so they're they're i mean it seriously it was the least i could do they're the sweetest people and, you know what uh, you should do, do is order pizza and send it to them <laughs> what we do is we send the kids into uh to slip you know 40 dollars into the uh, tip jar when they're not looking so we distract yeah. them but no it's it, there's there's so many nice people um you know you you my buddy kevin and there's dean laurie and and uh tony bancroft and there's of course, my wife and just so many people that made all of this stuff happen. Um, we had a really good time um, bringing that family back in. And they were in the film. And uh, my wife plays the fat lady Petunia uh, in the film. And, uh, and, and it, but we just, we just had such a good time. So look, the movie isn't Citizen Kane. It's, it's my first film. It, you know, it was done for a fifth of a Pixar budget. 
but we had so much fun. And I hope that when you guys watch it, you can see the fun and the joy that we had in making it. Okay. Everybody check that out when you get a chance, please do. Well, hey, well, Scott, thank you so much for your time tonight. It's been amazing. Well, um, thank I you, Hector. Tonight, thanks, for, thanks for moderating. And, uh, and thank you all for, for hanging out with me. Absolutely. And hey, students, so in the chat, uh, you know, once again, big shout out to Scott for taking his time tonight. Uh, it's really, really cool to have alumni come back and talk about their journey. Uh, last thing I'm going to do in the chat is if you're interested in looking at the university, whether you're going to be a student for undergrad, graduate, if you're in high school and you want to look at the pre-college program, um, when the chat slows down, I'm going to literally just chat blast everybody here, a bunch of links. Uh, but all of these links here are going to take you to different things. Um, we have a little bit for everybody. I have a link to the application of the university, a link to scholarships, upcoming events, our spring show, which is the best of our best student work that we do every year. And then my email address. I'm just going to tell you flat out, I saw a ton of emails come through. But if you're interested in looking at the school, you have questions, you're lost, you don't know what to do, whatever, just send me an email. We'll just start off with a conversation. That's going to be the main thing. Just we'll start off with a conversation. We'll figure out what it is that you're looking to do. And whether it's this university or a different school, whatever it may be, we'll be happy to just help you with the best advice possible. And then, uh, hey, can you email me? I, I just don't know your email or else I would. So I'm going to send you my email. And uh, then, then I can at least uh, do everything uh, by getting in touch with you there. So, hey, folks, so I guess what we'll do is we'll go ahead and end the recording here. Uh, like usual, what we'll do is we'll end the recording. I'm not actually going to stay back here on camera to answer any more questions that may come in or things that come up and, and hang back in the chat. But for recording purposes, we'll say good night and thank you all for being here. And uh, once again, thank you so much to Scott, uh, the star of the show tonight. Thanks, students. Thank you.